Hello my soccer universe uh, to another book review and now I'm looking at a book that is a um, very comprehensive but at times exhaustive read. It is The Ball is Round, a global history of soccer or football. I think uh, only in the US version that I hold here it was called soccer, everywhere else here it's called football. It's written by David Goldblatt and if you're interested in the history of soccer, also in the history of the late 19th, 20th century, up until the break of dawn of the millennium, that's a book for you to read. Uh, there is hardly any corner of the world that remains untouched by this book. Uh, there is hardly any story that is not in some uh, way <laughs> mentioned. The book has an un incredible, and I'm uh, not, not not counting here uh, the conclusion. Incredible, eight hundred ninety nine pages. Then there's a conclusion. Then there are lots of bi uh, bibliographical notes um, that you can or uh, notes that uh, lead you to explore further. Uh, as far as a history record goes. This is the ultimate book. Uh, it is a read that I know when I read it, it was, it took me a long time to read it, but it also has has to be said this was one of those eye opens, especially, I'm not going to read uh, through that now, but especially the chapter on Africa, where you get the whole backstory of uh, African nations becoming independent and getting their own great um, nations and how soccer actually helped there. Uh, also that um, countries on the North Sea and um, uh, even for, 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 for further east like Belgium, Sweden and so on had very early soccer, um, very early were uh, exposed to soccer, much earlier than uh, countries that are now Stalwarts, so they were actually like in the 30s, it being a World Cup, the dominant uh, countries like um, Central Europe, Italy, and, and and so on. That was also an interesting part. Uh, it also doesn't gloss over, over disaster. Uh, it has a bunch of really interesting pictures, I have to say. Uh, here, the first stadium disaster um, in Glasgow is one of the first ones. Uh, this one I actually like also. You see here uh, English League participation in the 30s. You have here a shot of San Zero, uh, Alfredo Di Stefano scoring against Manchester United. Uh, what else do we have? Yes, Eusebio scoring against Milan in 63, Milan eventually winning, Karaif against uh, in Barcelona. Um, heating crowd trouble uh, a little bit later on. Uh, there's a really famous picture uh, that actually seems like um, Maradona against Belgium in 1982. Argentina lost that match and it looks like Maradona is taking on a whole bunch of players. I read the story behind this picture not long, too long ago. This was actually after a free kick that was played to the side and that's why the Belgian players are lined up so neatly. They just get out of the wall. But as a picture itself, it is like, yep, this is what Maradona in 82 was like. So that was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, what else do we have here? More catastrophes. Escobar and some uh, the Zambian football. Uh, Hillsborough was also up there. And yeah, that book picture we already saw. And as the cover of another um, book that I already talked about. Um, there's everything in there. And to demonstrate how detailed this book is, I'm gonna give you a large reading. And it is about uh, in after World in the in between wars, uh, Austria, and that's why I'm wearing the Austria jersey, and especially Vienna became the center of European uh, football, soccer, however you want to call it, um, especially uh, on the continent outside of Great Great Britain as the uh, prevalent soccer city. And I'm reading a, 
a little bit. I'm just giving you a taste, but it will still be three or four pages that I'm gonna read. It starts out, the chapter is called Pay Up, uh, Pay Up, Pay Up and Play the Game. And it's uh, section four within the chapter. So there's a lot of sections within the chapters as well. Vienna is the football capital of the European continent. Where else can you see at least 40 to 50,000 spectators gathering Sunday after Sunday, rain or shine? Where else is the majority of the population so interested in the results of the games that you can hear almost every other person talking about the results of the league matches and the club's prospects for the coming games? The answer was nowhere. Budapest and Prague came close, but they could be considered as part of the same phenomenon as football in Vienna, which in 1924 became the first place outside of Britain to stage a professional league. The Hungarians and the Czechs followed almost immediately, emboldened by their neighbor and fearful of losing players to the Austrian capital. But why here? Why should the Nubian Central Europe, where football had been merely popular before the First World War, experience vertiginous rates of growth afterwards? In part, it was uh, a product of fission of the emergencies released by the disintegration of the old political and social frameworks of the region. As the war came to its grim conclusion in November 1918, it had become apparent that the game was up for the Habsburgs and the multinational empire. The last emperor, Karl I, abdicated and within a year was gone to Switzerland. At the peripheries, the Hungarians, the Czechs, the Poles, and the Yugoslavs were all asserting their national independence, leaving a diminished micro-Austria at the center of the now dissolved uh, monarchy. From the steps of the Vienna Rathaus on uh, the 12th of November 1918, this new Austrian Republic was brought into being, though so it was far from clear who actually wanted it. The Pan-Germans wanted Anschluss with the larger neighbor, the Socialists and the newly formed Communists wanted the Workers' Republic, and the Christian Democrats were calling for a constitutional monarchy. In a series of plebiscites that only just confirmed the state's uh, precarious existence, the Vorarlberg region voted to join Switzerland, the territorial Tyrol and Salzburg to join Germany. Vienna itself transformed from a city of 2.1 million, from which a multinational empire of 52 million people was ruled, to a city of 1.8 million, ruling a nation of predominantly German speakers, numbering just 6.4 million. The singularity of Vienna, which had been in part obscured by the multifaceted character of the Habsburg Empire, was brought into stark relief in the sharply divided cultural and political landscape of the Rump Austria. Uh, then there's a whole part that uh, explains a little bit more on Vienna that I want to um, gloss over. And uh, it also describes that um, the whole Aust Vienna was, uh, you know, there was the social democrats against the socialists, each with their own uh, football culture, then some of um, foreigners like uh, Jews and Slovaks in, in addition, but that's a whole of one and a half pages that I want to gloss over, but uh, it is super interesting to read over. It was in this intense football milieu that Europe's first professional football league was created by the continent's first significant uh, football thinking bureaucrat. The organizing intelligence behind the growth of Viennese football was Hugo Meisel. He was born in 1881 in Moleschau, Bohemia, to an upper-class Jewish family who moved to Vienna in 1893. As a teenager, Maya played inside forward for Wiener Amateure, which is now Austria-Vienna, while uh, attending a commercial academy, training for a career in business. But it was family connections that secured him a position as a clerk with the Länderbank. Banking never occupied more than a fraction of his time and considerable energy. He served first as a secretary of the Austrian FA and then as coach of the national team from 1912 until his death in 1937. But for this period of war service, Meisel was directly responsible for the creation of the world's first regular international club tournament, the Metropa Cup, as well as the continent's first tournament, tournament for national teams, the Dr. Gero Cup. Alongside the illustrious teams of FK Austria, which he also ran, Meisel was also the coach and creator of Austria's Wunder Team, which bestrode the world of international football in the early 1930s. The decisive act that made all of these developments possible was the legalization of professionalism, remarking on the transition to openly commercial football. Meisel later remarked that it had been a commercial gamble, but in practical terms, he was merely formalizing what was already in operation. What was already in operation was not merely the usual panoply of under-the-table payments, inflated expenses and invented jobs that characterized pre-professional football everywhere. In addition, Vienna possessed a broad and sophisticated football culture, whose intimate interconnections with the city's intelligentsia and the popular cultures of cinema and music were the preconditions for both a successful commercialization of the game and the creation of a unique style of the Nubian football. The crucible of uh, this cultural fusion was where most things in Vienna began. 
the Viennese coffee house. I'm gonna end it here. I could read a lot more, but it is absolutely you see the denseness of the material. Uh, what I read here was basically uh, I skipped two pages. I read to you about four pages worth of material. Uh, skipping those two pages, so basically it's two and a half pages I read. It's a great book. If you want to know about the history of soccer in a global context, I only can say read this book. The ball is round. Um, you won't. You will not regret it. Anyway, let me know if you've read this book or if there are other books on the history of soccer that you can recommend. I doubt it is as uh, full of content as this one. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel as it will keep you updated on all the things that are rotating in my soccer universe. And with that, I'm going to wish you a wonderful day. Bye.